Cool. Well, good, good on Dell. They're doing better than a lot of the board partners do. This is gonna be a fun one. If you remember this, this is an Alienware pre-built that we reviewed. And today we are taking from it, I was not sure if that was gonna fall over or not. Uh, we're taking from it the RTX 4090. I'll just, I'll just put, put that over there. We're taking the RTX 4090 from it and we're gonna test that standalone. So 4090, obviously pretty high heat generating component. There's a lot of trust being put into Dell here to make a good OEM card because they're not using an NVIDIA Founders Edition. They're using a reference PCB. Now this is actually really valuable because a reference PCB is generally speaking going to have the best compatibility with things like water blocks. Now the one challenge is that this time there are technically a few different reference designs. We spoke to EK about it. Uh, this is one of them, for example. It's remarkably similar to the Dell 4090 today. Either way, we already successfully put an alpha cool block on this Dell 4090. But even with that avenue opened up, we're still going to look at the stock cooler for the Dell RTX 4090 because we want to see how well it does. This has actually been one of the two places that Dell has genuinely impressed us with the Alienware pre-built in the past. These builds, as you've seen, have been an absolute disaster. This is lazy and cheap. I should not be holding this this way, although it's not worth anything. But the power supply that we reviewed came from Dell's server division, and that was actually really good. And the same went for the last Dell GPU we looked at. So now we're looking at the newest one, and uh, it's got a large flow through area as well. So. Let's take a look. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace and visiting squarespace.com slash gamersnexus will give you 10% off your first purchase with them. We've built a number of our own websites with Squarespace, including our recently launched gamers.nexus site where we list catastrophic PC hardware failures to inform subscribers of those failures. I built this site personally in a couple of hours by using Squarespace's Fluid Engine to move blocks around visually until I liked it. We also built our store website with Squarespace using its built-in e-commerce tools. And of course, we built a website for our CEO Snowflake because she demanded our audience know who really runs the show. Get to the core of your idea and spend less time on web design by signing up at squarespace.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. So the Dell 4090, it's got a couple of quirks. First of all, it uses a lot of plastic, but it also has a large fin stack and it has a large hole punched out in it because the PCB stops short. And so there's a bunch of area for flow through cooling where the air comes in the front of the third fan and gets pushed out the end. And part of our testing today, just for fun, we taped that up with some heavy duty Gorilla tape two layers of it if you want to replicate the testing. And we just tested in a like for like scenario how much that actually matters. It's more for fun. It was pretty interesting actually. But for quirks, the card does not allow overclocking. So the VBIOS sadly is somewhat power restrained. That's because OC software doesn't let us set over 100% power target. So there's no room to do any overclocking whatsoever on this. This is probably Dell trying to limit its liabilities and limit how much it's supporting. But realistically, an extra 10% power really isn't going to hurt uh, the, the 4090 as Dell ships it. And it'd be nice to have that extra headroom to just be more flexible once it leaves the pre-built and enters someone else's system. Now for our testing today, we're mostly just focused on the Dell card, but we also have an Asus Strix in here. The Strix obviously is a better card. There's no dispute about that. It's just we want to see what sort of a, a, a highly regarded partner model looks like. In other words, what's what's the lower limit for thermals for Dell's 4090 if it were to try and compete. Now, the biggest difference here is that the Asus card has a much more stable power delivery. It has a higher power a target with overclocking options. And so it can push a lot more. You do a lot more with it. It's also got multi V BIOS, whereas the Dell card has a single V BIOS, but it's still an interesting comparison point. So we're going to start the video that is with the teardown. But for testing purposes, just know that we did all of our benchmarking before taking the card apart so as not to disturb the thermal pads or the thermal paste as Dell applied it. We wanted it to be as stock as possible. But the teardown is interesting, so we're going to start there. As we take this apart, one of the key things to sort of take note of is going to be this PCB where we want to determine if this is a reference PCB or not. And without spoiling too much, uh, this massive thing next to me here is going to end up having the, the Dell 4090 in it right there with a water block on it, which is why we want it to be a reference PCB. Now, reference does not mean Founders Edition. So that's one of the things I'm going to be checking when I take this apart. 
Uh, reference specifically, we're going to be looking for clearances of components like chokes and uh, the VRM to make sure the water block will fit. And commonly, OEMs use reference designs. So anyway, the cooler extends well past the length of the PCB. And our testing later will cover this up with two layers of duct tape just as a sort of fun, hey, does this do anything type of experiment with the uh, noise normalized and a fan sort of normalized control. And looking around this, at the top, uh, they have actually gotten the shroud completely out of the way of the exhaust, which is great. So the air is going to push in down through the fans, of course. And when it wants to exit, it is fairly unrestricted to exit out the top of the fin stack or out the back of the cart. Now, the bottom is a different story. They've covered up the fin stack on the bottom here with the shroud. So this is an interesting choice. But what they're doing looks intentional because they have almost these ducts that you can see they do exit. They kick out down here, and it almost looks like Dell is maybe trying to force the air under the card back that way or something. Um, that's that's the best guess I have. I don't think this is for looks. I think that was an intentional cooling choice. Uh, I can't say it'd be better than just exhausting it straight down into the motherboard, but maybe they're trying to do some flow guidance that might contribute to some of the noise profile we'll look at later as well. On this side of the card, we've got a perforated I.O. plate, which is always a good thing. However, the uh, fin stack is not perforated, so the only air exiting here is going to be whatever kind of gets out that way from the fan. Okay, now we're going to move to start taking it apart. So for connectors, I need to be aware of. We've got two right here for the fans. Maybe, maybe there's an LED or it's just the fans have two different ones. We'll look soon. And these are at least externally accessible, which is great, actually. That makes it much easier. We're going to start with removing the back plate and see if that just comes free on its own. And for tools, I'm going to be working with the GN Teardown Toolkit that we've tuned for GPUs. Most GPUs can be taken apart with all the tools we have in the kit. And I'm also working on one of our brand new GN15 mod mats that you can see underneath here. We're going to be tracking the screws over on the screw tracking grid off to the side. So this assembly is pretty straightforward here so far. All right, we're going to see if the back plate just comes off or not. No hidden screws under that. Yep. Cool. Well, good, good on Dell. They're doing better than a lot of the board partners do. Uh, they have thermal pads contacting the back. So they're mostly in touch with uh, filtering capacitors. Uh, but the part that's important is these are contacting the back of the memory modules. So they're leveraging that extra area. Memory is flip chip BGA, which means the silicon of the memory is actually normally, depending on the layer count, but normally closer to the back side of the PCB rather than the top side of the module. Sinking into the back plate here, which it's not finned or anything, but it's still, it's a lot of surface area. It's metal. This is an aluminum, it feels like. So that's what they should be doing. It can be worth a couple degrees, depends on the design for the rest of the cooler. So this is going to be half of the VRM. This is the other half. You can see where the, the inductors are and where the MOSFETs and the, the, the caps are. So this is, uh, this is looking to me like it might be a reference design, which would be great for our purposes for a water block. Yeah, this should just pop off at this point after we remove the... Um, the screws in the I.O. plate. Let's do, let's do it like that. Looks like only two screws for the I.O. plate. I might, I might try to disconnect these. Uh, if you ever do this, remember to, as much as you can, pull on the connector housing, not on the cables. Okay, we are free from both of those, which just reduces risk of anything getting caught. That came loose, no cables. Wow, all right. So they've got nickel plated copper uh, base plate here for the memory modules. This contacts the thermal pads that contact the memory modules. And underneath the base plate is the vapor chamber and the heat sink. So one of the cool things with vapor chambers is, I don't know how well this shows on camera, but you can see these little circles like dots. And this is not like a manufacturing defect or anything like that. Uh, this is something we saw years ago in a, in a factory where inside of here, underneath this circle, there's going to be a column, like a pillar of copper that comprises the vapor chamber, and they're everywhere. So that helps with increasing the surface area internally, and then there's some liquid in there, thus vapor. Underneath here, there's a, a vapor chamber contact in the GPU, and then they're combining the vapor chamber with heat pipes. It's a good mixture of 
of uh, coin solutions here. And these heat pipes are going to be 10 millimeter pipes for the largest ones. It looks like five massive ones coming out over here with three of these 10 mils going straight through the center of the GPU, which is exactly what you want. So it's vapor chamber and then the three 10 mils. But the point is to have those high heat capacity, uh, high heat carrying pipes as close to going across the GPU core as possible, covering as much surface area of the GPU as possible. And they've done that here, which is, that's gonna contribute a lot to the cooling. Now, as for where those pipes are going, so I can see five from where I am right now, but uh, at least five are going this direction, straight through the massive fin stack, including this part that sticks, protrudes down because it's not over PCB. So they're actually leveraging this extra depth that they have of clearance without the PCB there to extend the height, the Z height of the fin stack, which is great. And all that air is gonna just push through and come out here. Some of the air is getting pushed down to the PCB level to hit the board components that aren't directly cooled by the base plate or, uh, or the copper heat sink, this being the base plate in this instance. One of the things I noticed looking at this, you'll see these exposed patches of metal where there's no paint on the heat sink. So we've got these just direct metal contacts. I was looking at the PCB and those actually line up with these perfectly. I don't know if that's to give a path to ground or if that's a toggle, a tamper of some kind. That may cause, I guess we'll find out when we water block this. As for the PCB, so interestingly here, they have room where they could populate more. Uh, they've got spots for capacitors that aren't populated. They have spots for VRM phases. So maybe unnecessary for this particular 4090 but it leaves room if they were to go up to say, if there's a 4090 Ti or something, a lot of room to expand this board uh, that's not currently fully leveraged because it may not need to be for this card, but it could be in the future. So the thermal paste spread, this almost looks like oddly manual. So a lot of times for cards that are mass produced, they'll use a phase change uh, sheet that they put on it. And then as soon as it heats up, it, it changes into a, more of a, paste-like substance, but it makes things more automatable. So, I mean, this is just an AD102 300A1 die, which is what we'd expect. So that's it for the teardown, at least. Very easy to take apart. I'm always thrilled about that. There were no tamper seals or warranty void stickers, which is also great because it's just showing a certain level of respect for the customer because there's not really enforceable um, and, and they're kind of silly. So. Good to not see those at this point. And otherwise, in terms of screws, I mean, if we look over here, this was everything to get down to the level we're at. You could take this shroud off the heat sink if you wanted to, that would be a lot more screws. There's not really a reason you'd do that in a repair scenario other than to uh, get those fans out of there, but they'd all go back together. So it's about 15 screws uh, to, I think there actually there might be two more I'm missing. So it's like 17 screws to get down to the PCB. So accessibility is really good. To get the fans wouldn't be too hard either. You'd just take those out uh, with another three to four screws per fan. Um, then you could swap it with a standard part online. So in terms of repairability, this car is, is relatively accessible, which we like to see, especially from an OEM. So at least on this front, Dell continuing the trend of putting together reasonably well-built video cards, even at the high end, despite sort of their issues with the total system assembly and the motherboard proprietary standards, things like that. Uh, so we're gonna cut back over to the rest of the video now, including some of the benchmarks. We'll look at thermal performance now. For these comparisons, we've only included the RTX 4090 Strix as an ultra high-end comparison. The point is just to offer a reference, not to determine which of these two cards is better. They're obviously very different. This chart shows the steady state averages. At equilibrium, the Dell 4090 held 73 degrees Celsius GPU core with its auto setting, which stabilized at 52% fan speed or about 1980 RPM. Hotspot was 86 here. It's really not bad, or at least it's definitely better than we would have expected from something as high power consuming as a 4090 made by an OEM. The memory temperature was 78 degrees, also not great, but it's well within spec. Uh, this might only become problematic if in a very high ambient case with non-stop load on the memory, like a former mining use case. So here we think it's really not a problem. With auto, the Strix card was about 10 degrees cooler in the core metric, about 7 degrees cooler for hotspot, and a significant 13 degrees cooler for memory. But this comparison isn't good enough because 
auto doesn't tell us what noise levels they are. They could be running at very different noise. The Strix runs significantly lower RPM, and it's also quieter when left to auto. So, normalizing for noise levels required increasing the Strix's fan speed. We went from 1495 RPM to 1871, which equalized the noise levels with Dell's 1978 or so RPM. The noise normalized Strix was another 2 to 3 degrees cooler in most metrics. Again though, the point isn't to determine whether the Strix is the better card. Obviously it is, and Dell wouldn't disagree. But it's just to provide a reference for a bare bones design versus one of the better partner models on the market. The most important factor though is that the Dell 4090 passed our thermal torture test, which is often the most we really seek from a bare bones design like this one. As for power consumption, we found these two cards were within 10 watts of each other, so that's remarkably close for stock performance. That means that they were power normalized within variants. Purely as a curiosity, we decided to cover up the flow through area of the card with this. This is something we've been wondering about, so it's just an academic exercise. There's no practical use case here. We used two layers of heavy duty gorilla tape to cover a hole in the back blade. We also controlled the fan speed and the power target. So all variables were fixed except the presence of the flow through hole. In a typical older school design, they'd have a piece of metal here, probably with a PCB in front of it, even if that PCB is mostly blank. So we can't 100% replicate it, but this at least blocks off the flow through area. Taping it over increased temperature by about 5 degrees Celsius across the board, plus or minus a little bit here. The large flow through area that Dell included does actually do something, and it clearly helps the GPU thermals. This card came from our Alienware R15 previously, although the same concept would apply to the R16 that we're working on now. The card will pull air in through a mix of the front intake fan and the lower ventilation of the side panel. Then anything passed through the flow through hole will hit the top exhaust from the CPU cooler. Although this increases the effective ambient of the CPU cooler intake, these larger 240mm liquid coolers are more capable of handling it and the GPU will benefit more than the CPU will lose, especially given Dell's clamping down on the power budget, which we'll see in a minute. Now for the fun part, noise levels were tested in our new GN Hemi Anechoic Chamber, which is a special testing environment for hyper accurate acoustics analysis. It eliminates as much background noise as possible, allowing us to ensure data isn't interfered with by other office or world noise. To support our continued purchase of equipment like this, please head over to patreon.com slash gamersnexus and throw a few bucks our way. Our Patreon supporters have been enabling this type of work for years now, and you can be part of our next big equipment purchases. We've been getting a ton of immediate use out of the acoustic chamber, as it's already popped up in our Ally review, our Fractal Terra deep dive, and our Dan A4H2O case reviews, and now this one. Let's take a look at some data. Starting with the frequency spectrum analysis, Dell's auto profile tends to settle at 1978 RPM under our test conditions. The frequency spectrum has some stronger levels towards the low end, particularly at 200 Hz up to 800 Hz or so. The last few devices we've tested have been at the higher pitched end of this, mostly because they've been handheld gaming PCs. Those smaller fans run much whinier. The Dell card falls off gradually after 2000 Hz, decaying without any abrupt frequency changes that might be more annoying to a human listener. Plotting the ASUS card now at auto, this configuration is overall much quieter across the spectrum. Its behavior tends to have a sooner fall off around 1200 Hz, where we see our final spike before it begins to decay. It levels out briefly at 2500 to 4000 Hz before falling further. Finally, a rough noise normalized DBA SPL Strix at 1870 RPM followed a similar frequency spectrum to the Dell 4090. The Dell card had higher levels at 200 to 400 hertz, but otherwise they're very similar noise profiles. And now for the noise levels, also measured in the Hemi Anechoic Chamber, we end up with this chart. The Dell card runs a higher RPM at a given percent and has less overall range, so its noise level is higher per percentage increase. But like for like with RPM, they're often within 1 to 2 dBA of each other. But the Strix is favored for cooling, as we saw earlier. The Dell card's progression of noise is similar to the Strix. We're not seeing any sudden spikes or flattening along this curve, and the card tends to stay within 35 to 35.5 dBA range when auto tested at 1 meter and with a noise floor of 13.7 dBA. And finally, here's the most important plot following all the rest of this. Frequency. This looks at the sustained frequency for the GPU in megahertz over a prolonged workload. The Dell 4090 fluctuates actually kind of a lot for core clock with a modern 40 series card, with a range of plus or minus 100 megahertz. 
It's relatively high, point to point, for a 4090, especially because most partner models now will hold a steadier, flat frequency. To demonstrate this, we can add the Strix to the plot. It's at a flat 2730 MHz, whereas the Dell card ranges from 2650 to about 2745. Dell is hitting a power perf cap limit when we looked into this, whereas the Strix is hitting a more normal voltage reliability limit. To flatten this frequency and boost higher, Dell would have to allow vBIOS to pull more power, so it'd need to change its firmware. We could do this ourselves if they unlocked it, but unfortunately the card is locked to 100% in OC software. This isn't a necessary lock, we're not really sure why they do it, uh, other than they probably just don't want to support the feature. Wrapping things up, the Dell card is actually performing pretty well overall, so GPU core temperature was honestly lower than we expected it to be, considering the relative size of the Dell heatsink and card, and the fact that it's an OEM made card. Uh, they don't typically run the highest quality anything in those, it's just going to be reference, which is most commonly from the manufacturer of the GPU, so NVIDIA has uh, reference design, AMD has them, Intel has them, they provide those to the OEMs, the OEMs are free to modify them how they want, so they have a strong starting point. But for the cooler, it appears to be doing overall well. Regardless of who designed that, we're not sure. Uh, we'd assume Dell had some hand in it, it's possible Nvidia helped them. But at the end of the day, for something that is so incredibly basic as a card compared to partner models that are much larger, they're embellished with all sorts of LEDs, the shrouds are fancier, they use a lot more metals, uh, the Dell card is competing reasonably well. The pre-builds have a lot of problems, the ones we've looked at, so like motherboards for example, very problematic for Alienware builds or Dell builds, but the power supplies have done well and the GPUs we've looked at have done well. And so if you wanted to buy, say, a Dell 4090 or whatever from eBay, and we'd assume their lower down stack cards uh, are also acceptable, if the 4090 is, then probably the 4080 or 70 would be, we haven't looked at those. But if you wanted to grab one on eBay or you wanted just a reference model PCB that you know you can fit a block onto, then that might be a, an avenue you can take. Now because of the variance this generation, as we said earlier, we're not sure how many different reference design blocks will fit on this PCB, but the Alpha Cool one we used did fit on it for what that's worth. And likewise, if you were planning to buy an Alienware or Dell pre-built of some kind, at least you know the GPU is good enough. So we weren't running into thermal throttling with it, uh, we didn't have any major acoustic complaints, and the power target is standard. So it, the frequency does limit itself a little bit, but uh, that's gonna happen with any of the cheaper 4090s out there because they are power hungry. So you lose some frequency as it starts to perf cap itself. But that's it for this one. It was fun to look at, fun to do a teardown. Uh, the teardown was actually relatively straightforward as well, which we liked. So always good to see, despite the serious issues that we've had with their pre-builds, it's good to see that Alienware and Dell are able to put together some uh, components competently because that gives us hope that all they have to do now is assemble the box around it well and design the cases better. And for that, we have the R16 review coming up, so check back for that one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly or store.gamersnexus.net to grab something like one of our large GN15 mod mats. They are on the store. Thanks for watching. See you all next time.